You know, one of the philosophies that I got from my mentor a long time ago, and it's kind of a, a slogan that I tell myself is, I treat everybody like they're gonna be with me forever, but I run my business like they're all gonna quit tomorrow. I don't wait for anybody. That's the first thing. I see a lot of up and coming leaders, Mike, they'll, they'll, they'll start building their team, they'll, they'll, they'll lay these eggs and they'll sit on their eggs and wait for them to hatch. If you want people to run with you, you have to start running. So what a lot of leaders do is they run out of the gates, they have some success, they, they start building and then they, they stop and they become a cheerleader and they become a manager. And I told my team the other day, I said, hey, if you wanna be a manager, you should go get a retail job, 75 grand a year, you're home for dinner and you get some benefits. That's what managers make, 75 grand a year. But if you wanna be a leader, you gotta lead. You know, our business, you and I, when we have a whole team show up, we're leading a volunteer army. None of my guys are on my payroll. They show up because they wanna be there, which I think is the, the greatest leadership challenge in the world. What's up, brother? Thanks for having me. Feeling blessed to be here with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. This is coming full circle because one of my first videos ever was an interview with you back at your old office. And, you know, I was just so inspired by your story and you had this huge following and you're, you know, hanging out, mentored by Ed Milet and all of these things. Yeah. And, and it's been incredible to, you know, be on this journey together now and, you know, see what's happened over the last few years. So I'd love to kind of set the tone with your story because you've got a pretty mm -hmm. crazy story that I think a lot of people will, uh, really relate to in some capacity, but also in terms of maybe the more unrelatable parts, we'll start to realize that what their situation is right now might not be as difficult as what others have had to face on their journey. So uh, I'd love to kind of unpack that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You want me to just get right into it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's dive in, man. Cause you know, I think the health side of things and, and, yeah. you know, where you've come is a testament of your, your mindset, your mental fortitude, grit, and all of those things. Awesome. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll just start quick at the beginning of my entrepreneur journey. So born and raised in Calgary, raised by a super hardworking family. My dad was a stonemason. My mom ran the, the family business. I, my dad was such a huge role model for me for hard work. And so he, he instilled hard work. Um, but in grade eight, I actually got a job at Earl's restaurant. So I got off the bus. I started, I, I asked it to get a job washing dishes. They couldn't even believe that I was there. Um, but they hired me. I, I think they felt sorry for me, but I showed up, they hired me. And that's a whole different story and how I got hired there. And I was making $4 and 25 cents an hour. Um, it was the only guy in, in, uh, in junior high and, and then high school, you know, putting in that kind of hours, but I just wanted to get in the game. And I think this is an important part of my story. I just wanted to get in the game. I just wanted to get in the environment. And I don't know if you can relate, Mike, but you know, my whole life, I, I, I felt overlooked. Um, you know, big part of my story is I have Crohn's disease. So I hit puberty late, you know, remember first day of grade 11, I walked into a new school and, and, and one of my later buddies said to me, he goes, Hey, are, are you here for the grade uh, seven class? It's just down the, it's just down the hallway. And I was like, actually, I'm here for grade 11, but that really sums it up. Like pick last for everything, not great at, at hockey. Cause I was always in the hospital and, and, and trying to recover. Um, but Earl's gave me a shot. They got me in the game. I started washing dishes. I worked my way all the way up to, to the baker. And then after high school, my parents really wanted me to go to, to university because they had a, a, a business that was growing. So I went to U of A, I drove to Edmonton. I, 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 I took a bilingual bachelor of commerce. I mean, if you're from Calgary, the greatest place on earth is Edmonton, obviously. Right. So, so I drove there, I took a bilingual bachelor of commerce, but I, I'd worked at Earl's for four more years. So I became the head baker. When I graduated from university, I had two options. This is, this is a pivotal moment in my, in my life. Earl's offered me a general manager position. I was 23 years old. It was probably a five and a half million dollar store. I would have made about a hundred to 105,000 a year, would have been the youngest GM in the company. But I remember going home on the weekend and talking to my parents and my dad, and my dad had this entrepreneur mindset. And I remember asking myself this question, how many 40 year olds are, are, are working at the restaurant? And there were a lot. And I started to think about all the bosses that I had, where do they all go? And I was like, oh, Jimmy quit and started a real estate company. Sarah's now in mortgages. And I thought entrepreneurship is what I need to do. So I turned it down. A week later, I had a conversation with my parents uh, about potentially coming into the family business. And what I realized, Mike, is that th that was my parents' dream, not mine. 
and I need to I need to pay my own path. They had a large company, a couple hundred employees. Now they they built the Tells Convention Center. This they built the Self Health Hospital. They built um, the Hyatt Hotel. They did the Bam Springs Hotel expansion. Very very successful company f- f- uh, from the ground up. I needed to find my own path. So I went back to Edmonton, and this is key. I was not looking for this industry, but I knew what I wanted my life to look like. I knew exactly what I wanted my life to look like, how I wanted to feel. Never thought in a million years I'd be in the insurance industry. So there I am sitting at a second cup and a, and a single mom prospected me. And she invited me out to a meeting. And I went out to this meeting. I couldn't even spell the word insurance, but I sat there. I don't remember a word they said, but I remember exactly how I felt. And I saw this as a vehicle to get me to where I wanted to go. See, I think a lot of people have it wrong. I think a lot of people, they choose the career and the vehicle and then they, and then they build the dream. I built my dream first and then I found the vehicle that had the horsepower. I needed a rocket ship that I could put rocket fuel in to get me to where I wanted to go. So I got into the insurance business, started part-time, worked my ass off, came full-time, made six figures my first year, 150 the second, couple hundred thousand the third. I mean, it's one of the highest paying industries in North America. But then life hit me. And in 2009, my Crohn's disease took over. I, I lost my rectum, my colon, and eight feet of bowel. And I was in and out of the hospital the whole year. I lost 75 pounds. And I got out of there at the end of 2009, Mike. And I realized that I had 10, I had only had 10 licensed agents on my team, but I still made about 130,000 that year. And I made a decision to myself. I was going to get out of the producing business and I was going to get into the distribution business. In 2010, I got out of the insurance game, just like at some point you got out of the real estate game and you got into the distribution of real estate game. And from 2010, people don't know this part of my story. It took me seven years to recover from my surgery. I had a wound on my backside about this long, about this deep, and a wound up my front. It wouldn't close because my Crohn's disease So twice a week, I went to the Foothills Hospital for about four years and they cauterized them shut with a burn stick. They put something in my mouth, I'd bite down and they burn it, tears down my eyes, put a bandage, dress shirt back on, back to work, closing meetings. But I wanted to be somebody so bad that I was willing to do whatever it takes. So I understood that whether it was my health or a recession or anything that was coming, what I needed was, was I needed a team. The bigger the dream, the bigger the team. So I started recruiting and training and it wasn't weird to me anymore because now I was building my distribution model. And 13 years later, you know, we've, we have over 900 licenses in our organization. We're blessed. We're all over Canada and and in the U S. So that's, that's the quick version of my story, brother. Yeah, man, it's, it's so incredible. And and so many things to unpack there. And I think one of the concepts that I love that you're, you're such an advocate for is being in the right vehicle, right? It's like one of those concepts where if you want to cross the ocean, you can't do it in a kayak. You got to be in a cruise ship. Like, you know, and so many people, and I see this all the time in real estate, and I was that person too, where you just make the assumption that, you know, you, you get your license and as long as you close as many deals as you want for their, or it can for the rest of your life, somehow your dream life is magically just going to come together. And you start realizing as you unpack it that, most people aren't even in a vehicle that will get them to where they want to be. And and I was, you know, you know this, I was the type of person that, you know, talked negatively about some of these business models that had the ability to create partnerships and, you know, develop other leaders and share your knowledge like you and I are both in. And then I started realizing after you kind of remove the ego and emotion from the conversation and look at the math, that that's one of the only ways that will actually build the wealth and the time freedom that so many people are craving. And I think, you know, looking at at your story, looking at that that concept of leaders create leaders, I think a lot of people overlook creating leverage. And mm-hmm. I remember, you know, you've you've told me uh, before about your golden gooses and and you know being able to uh share your skill set with other people. And that's when you can start creating leverage because so many people are trying to do it themselves. And everything's riding on them. And, you know, it's it's been incredible to learn so much about what you've done. So, you know, there's starting with the leadership aspect, and then we'll kind of back into the mindset that you needed, but it, leading 900 people and mm-hmm. leading all kinds of people with different emotions, leading with people that are, you know, some are very few are putting the work in, very many are not putting the work in. And, and I think we both know how this story goes. You know, what is your advice to somebody that, has a team is trying to lead and and is maybe getting frustrated with people not putting in the work or they're struggling to scale. Like as a leader, what allowed you in, 
you know, I think quite frankly, an industry that some of these companies in your space as a whole have hit a plateau when it comes to total count. But there's mm-hmm. certain individuals like you that are exponentially growing within that far outpacing the attrition. You're blowing things up. You're scaling like crazy. Mm-hmm. What kind of led you to being such a great leader and your advice to other people looking to become a leader? Wow. That's, that, that's a million dollar question right there. Um, you know, one of the philosophies that I got from my mentor a long time ago, and it's kind of a, a slogan that I tell myself is I treat everybody like they're going to be with me forever, but I run my business like they're all going to quit tomorrow. I don't wait for anybody. That's the first thing I see a lot of up and coming leaders, Mike, they'll, they'll, they'll start building their team. They'll, they'll, they'll lay these eggs and they'll sit on their eggs and wait for them to hatch. Right. I've never seen a dog chase a parked car. If you want people, if you want people to run with you, you have to start running. So what a lot of leaders do is they run out of the gates, they have some success, they, they start building and then they, they stop and they become a cheerleader and they become a manager. And I told my team the other day, I said, Hey, if you want to be a manager, you should go get a retail job, 75 grand a year, you're home for dinner and you get some benefits. That's what managers make 75 grand a year. But if you want to be a leader, you got to lead, right? You got to lead, you know, our business, you and I, when we have a whole team show up, we're leading a volunteer army. None of my guys are on my payroll. They show up because they want to be there, which I think is the, the greatest leadership challenge in the world. Hey, if you're a CEO of a big company and everybody on your, in your, in your, in your team is making 80 grand a year and they have to show up to your damn meeting. Yeah. Are you really a leader? No, you're a leader when they all show up on their own time because they want to. So that's the first thing is the mindset is that if you're not willing to do this with or without anybody on your team, you haven't made your decision yet. You just know when you're following somebody like Ed talks about always having a little bit of like dynamic friction where you got to decide that you're not just one of the guys, you're the damn leader. And when you're around somebody like an Ed or a leader, it should always be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit uncomfortable. Like even me and you, like I have so much respect for you and I've, and I've seen your journey, but when I'm around you, I just want to level the, level the hell up. Right? So you have to become that person. You can't be, you can't be waiting for people and, 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 you know, you know, sharing all your, your frustrations and your struggles and man, leaders vent up, never down in the eyes of your team. Everything's great. Everything's positive. Everything's working good. There's a comp change with the company. It's going to be unbelievable, right? Stock plan change. It's going to be the best thing for our company. You got some concerns, you vent up. So you got to be seen as the leader so that when you're around people, right? Uh, you have that ability to challenge them and they'll respond because they respect you. So if, if you want to build an organization and you mentioned it earlier, right? I don't, out of those, all the 980 people, my downline, there's probably 400 I've never met, to be honest, 300 I've never met. We're never in the, the same room at the same time, but you can build an army. If you build seven, 10, 15, 20 frontline people, right? You can build an army. People need to earn your time, right? If you want my time, you got to be hundred percent committed. You got to be showing up. You got to do what it takes. If not, I'll see you at the group meeting. One-on-one time with me, just like one-on-one time with you or anybody watching this. If you treat your time like you're a $20 an hour guy, people are going to treat you like that. So, so you, you have to, you have to get good at building leaders and that's, and I have a whole formula for that, but you got to get really good at building leaders. You have to decide you're going to be the leader, not just one of the guys. And, uh, and, and, and just, you know, study leadership and, uh, you know, and that's really how we've done it. Yeah. I love that. And, and again, you know, we, we see this all the time where, yeah, and, and I'm seeing this at an exhaustive rate right now, which is people catch your energy. And I see this right now with a lot of other people at, at EXP, for example, where, they're complaining about other competing brokerages. They are complaining about interest rates. They're complaining about, you know, buyer's commission, uh, you know, getting restructured in the big lawsuits that are like all that they're doing is complaining and they're complaining to their whole revenue share organization. No wonder you're facing insane attrition and retention issues because all you're doing is spewing negativity and discouragement into other people. Whereas like if you're in my group, you know, things could be hitting the fan behind the scenes half the time they are, but I show up on that call like, the world is in the most beautiful place it's ever been. And I think people really need to be mindful of that um, when it comes to their energy levels. So I love that you really 
uh, kind of unpack that. And and again, I'd love to lean into that a little bit where you've kind of segued into developing leaders, because this is a business where if it doesn't duplicate, it doesn't matter. And so many people build something, you know, I, I guess one of the best ways to say this is that I spoke recently in front of the top 50 producers in Canada. And one of the number one coaches in real estate asked me, Mike, when people are partnering with you, what are they looking to achieve? And my response to that is that they're looking to emulate the results that I have had. And mm-hmm. so many people haven't created an mm-hmm. ascension of what they want or what others can do in order to emulate it. But I think what you've become the master at, and this is the other thing that I said, is that when you look at agent attraction or attraction when it comes to insurance, he also asked me, Mike, why do you think most people struggle to attract? And my response is because they haven't become attractive. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you're sitting there bitching, complaining, whining, and you're not consistent, you're not disciplined, you're out of shape, your mind's in the gutter, you everything is falling apart, like nobody's attracted to that. So you're not going to attract anybody. But if you're showing up as a leader and you're leading by example at the highest level, speed mm. of the leader, speed of the pack, you become attractive. People are naturally going to attract themselves to you. So mm. what does it look like for you in terms of being that role model, being that person that's leading by example. But then the second phase of that is how are you then developing others to do what you've done by avoiding the mistakes? Whew, that's so good. Oh man, this is so good. Uh, this is this is deep in the leadership. Um, the, fir- the, the, the first part of your question, uh, I want to say this to that. Um, I think people have this misconception that they have to be this polished person to be a great leader. You just got to be on your damn journey. You're either a stock that's on the rise or you're a stock that's, that, that's falling. People aren't stupid. They're buying you. They're not buying EXP. They're not buying my company. They're buying me as a leader, right? They're, they're, they're buying me and they're buying you. It's like, yeah, you're right. People bitch and moan. It's like, listen, you don't look, let's talk about health for a second. Let's say you're not in the kind of shape that you want to be in. Maybe you've, maybe you've gone downhill the last three years. Just get on your journey. Just get on your journey and share your journey. So one thing I talk about is get on your journey and share your journey, right? I'm not where I want to be person development wise, but are you always reading a book and recommending it? Are you, are you always talking about where you're at with your fitness journey? Don't pretend like you're a, you're, you're an athlete going to the Olympics. If you're not, I talk about all the time, like, Hey, I'm not where I want to be, but man, I'm on my journey. I do a WhatsApp video once a week from the gym. I'm on my journey. Hey guys, I just read this good book. I'm recommending podcasts. I'm on my journey. So there needs to be evidence. If you were convicted in the court of law of being a stock on the rise, would there be enough evidence to convict you in in all your areas? So I love what you said. Like, yeah, I get it. I want to be here too. And I want to be, I want to be a 10 and 11 out of 12. But if you're a two, is there evidence you're on your way to a four? People will follow you if they feel like you are on the rise. So, so that's the first part of that, that I wanted to say. The second thing is this building leaders is about building trust. I get into these organizations, Mike, and I, and I see these people and I get on these calls, right? I'm on these zoom calls. We're like, Hey, can you close my call? I get on there. And they're just, they're just browbeating people. And what they're missing is the first step to building a leader is how is building trust. Like do you, when's the last time you took the advice from somebody you like didn't trust? No, it's just like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I don't even trust him. He doesn't even know me, right? Even if it's decent advice. So you got to be building trust. When you find somebody in your organization that you think could be one of your next big leaders, Ed always told me your job is to try and get in their wedding party. You got to build trust. You got to build relationship. You're going to have to share a bit of your life, a little bit of your time, maybe a little bit of your money, spend a little bit of go to lunch with them, open up your life, right? You might have to open up, God forbid, open up a Sunday to spend. You're like, I don't work Sundays. I'm like, well, good luck with that. Like, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you, you have to work Sundays, but you got to be willing to do whatever it takes to build leaders. So you build trust. Second is you want to identify their blessings. I'm constantly on these calls in other organizations and I look around and I'm like, man, this, these people lack confidence. They don't even know why they could be great at this thing, right? Once you have the trust and then you can, then you tell them it means something. Sarah, let me tell you why I think you're going to be great at this business. Cause nobody cares more about people than you do. Nobody cares. And I know that you're, you're, you're worried about closing and you, and you haven't had any sales yet. 
But, but if you can, if you can care that much about people, I can teach you how to close. The next is you instruct them on what to do. But number four is you challenge them. Strategically, you challenge them. Not all the time, not every day, but once in a while I get on the phone, bro. And I'm like, Hey, where are you at, bro? Like you're way better than that. You're way better than that. And you know what? Because I have a relationship, because I've identified their blessings, because we're foxhole buddies, guess what they do? Number five is they respond and they grow their identity as a result. So there's a formula to building leaders. And once you understand the formula to building leaders, even when my guys know I'm doing it to them, they love it because they love knowing what people love knowing as long as it's true. What is it about them that's going to, that, that's going to help them win? And so, so those are a couple of things on my mind around that question. Yeah. I love it, dude. And, and again, like you're such, and I've seen this in you, you're so amazing at being able to tell people their gifts and nobody feels better than when somebody compliments them on something that they know or believe to be true, but is never often reinforced. And I think you've done such an incredible job at that. Um, and again, creating that ascension plan for people to be able to emulate what you've done. And I think a concept that, that Ed also talks about is that your goals and vision has to be so big that everybody else can fit their dreams within yours. And I think not enough people are casting that vision on their team of helping them understand, like, here's how you fit into this. The like, guy recently launched a mastermind and is absolutely blowing up engagement like I've never seen. And on the very first call, I sat down and I said, we're going to 10,000 people. I'm buying an airplane hangar. We're going to create content zones, wellness hubs, crazy garages. Like, here's the impact we're going to make. We're going to help a thousand people make a million dollars a year. We're going to impact 10,000 lives. We're going to feed millions of people. Like, here's day one, how you fit into this. And I think that's what really brought that camaraderie from day one. But so many people, you know, question like, what am I even important? Why am I doing this? Am I just building their dream? Can I build my own? And you've done such a good job at at casting that. And I think one of the things that I would echo from what you said earlier that I think is a really, really important concept because a lot of team leaders burn out because mm -hmm. they're trying to basically reach down and bring everybody across the finish line. But one of the concepts that we really embody is you have to save the people swimming toward the boat, not the ones swimming away from it. And I'd love for you to kind of put your two cents in on that because I recently had a situation where, again, my time is valuable, one-on-one -on -one time. I have my group calls, but if you want to talk to me, you know, an agent reached out to me and said, Mike, you know, I'd love to get on a call. And my response was, you've got all the training you need in order to close your first deal or attract your first agent. Once you achieve either of those milestones, let me know and we'll book a call. Three weeks later, he closed his first deal and I had a call with him. And I think... So many people, as you alluded to, treat their time as just disposable, freely disposable, yeah. and then people take advantage of that. So how do, how do you go about allocating your time and identifying the people that have promise in them? Yeah, it's, you know, we, we, we sing, we speak the same language. I, I, I use the analogy of when you're in the airplane and the, and, and they talk about if the oxygen mask falls, even if you're sitting beside your five-year-old, you got to put your own oxygen mask on first. And I think so many people to use the drowning analogy, like if you jump in to try and save someone that's drowning, chances are you're going to drown too. So, you know, it's easy to get caught in the team. Uh, the, 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 it's easy to get caught in the, in the team activity. It's easy to get caught up in, in babysitting and managing. And I think people come by it honestly, because they were self-employed and now they're building a team and they feel a sense of responsibility. Well, listen, not everybody that starts the journey with you is going to end. Just remember this. There's people that I recruit on my team that are really good people. They're sitting at my desk, husband and wife, hand in hand, crying about how this is going to change their life, their kid's future. And then six months later, they didn't get rich quick enough and they're on to the next. You know, that, that really used to bother me until, until I was reminded this one day of, listen, maybe those people are in your business to learn something about themselves. And, and maybe they're there for you to learn something about you. Not everybody is going to be there long-term. I tell most of my leaders, until you have a huge team, like 70 to 80% of your day should be focused on personal. Personal prospecting, personal sales, personal development. You work on you. As soon as you start to slow down and let everybody speed up, you're going to get smoked, right? Remember in, like, remember in high school, everybody wants to date the pretty girl that's on the move, right? Every, every girl wants to date the jock who's like, 
a bit of a douche, but like they still wanted him. Why? Because everybody, everybody wants to be around somebody that that's, that's a little bit elusive, that there's, there's almost a mystique to them. If you're too available, right? They're going to walk all over you. One of the things I train my team on is that when you, every time you call a teammate to check in, right? I'm always like, you know, Hey Sarah, how you doing? Good. How's your day going? Good. What, you know, what's going on chit chat, how, how the kids good. And then I always say, Hey, listen, you know what, man, I just got off the phone with Mark, man. He just closed his third deal for the week. This team's on fire. Appreciate you sister. We'll see you at the training or I'll say, or I'll say, awesome. That sounds awesome. And I'll tell them about my day, man. I'm so fired up too. I just brought my third direct for the day, right? Just closed 15 K. I just want them to know that there's a lot going on outside of them. So as much as I care about them, and as much as I'm there to see them win, I want them, I want to remind them that they're not the only game in town on my team. And that whether they do this or they don't, Steve Holbrook's going to be okay. I love you guys. I respect all of you, but this team's going to the top. Ideally, it's with this group, but either way, we're going to find our way there. I love that, man. It's, you know, we, we do that all the time. And, and that's been one of the best things that we did as a leader is we, I took, we've got a call every Thursday morning for all of our top leaders. And uh, because we have that call, they've actually become like really good friends with each other, but they're hyper competitive. So they're smack talking each other. They're always trying to one up each other. They're doing bigger events, bigger dinners, crazier experiences for their teams. And it's awesome because we're all winning together, but it's this friendly fire where everybody's trying to one up each other. And I think that environment is so conducive to growth, but it's also in such a positive way. You're not trying to kill these people. You don't want them to fail. You just want to do better than them. And I think that environment is such a positive experience versus so many people having created that environment for people to grow together as leaders. Mm, I agree. Oh, man, so good. So, you know, there's there's three really important things that, I, that I'd love to unpack here. Investing into yourself, family, and then the mindset that you needed to bounce back from your experience. So I think let's start with investing into yourself. And I think one of the best ways to maybe lead into that is your story about getting mentored by Ed Milet and, and, and the risk that you took. So I think that really sets the tone of people like you and people like myself and people that that want to win and achieve their fullest potential in life are literally willing to do whatever it takes to go to that next level. Yeah. You know, I was at my first convention in Vegas and I'm sitting in the second top row. I got one guy with me. My light closes our convention. As, as, as many of you know, he's, you know, one of the biggest, biggest leaders has one of the biggest teams in our company still to this day. And he's, and, and I had all of a sudden he closed this meeting and I wrote right below his name, Mike, I wrote, I will make this man, my mentor. And I circled it two years later. I'm a junior broker a junior broker, not even a senior broker. And the, 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 the company was doing these golf tournaments and two weeks before the golf tournament, they released the online auction items. And this was the first and last time that he ever did this. There was a one-on-one -on -one day with Ed Milet. Included airfare, accommodations for two nights in one day and lunch with Ed. And I spent the, got to spend the whole day with him. So man, this thing came out and I was like, oh my God, I go to, I go to my bank, RBC, I extend my visa as high as I possibly could. I bid $12,000 on this auction item. I found out later that was U US dollars. So it cost me 15, but whatever. I bid this and then we ended up going to the golf tournament two weeks later and I don't, they shouldn't have told me this, but I found out the second highest bid was seven grand. So I overpaid by whatever that number is. And all my buddies were like making fun of me. They're like, oh my God, like you overpaid. I can't believe you did that. That was insane. Oh my God, was that thing undervalued. A few months later, I fly to LAX. Ed picks me up right in front of LAX in his company issue Mercedes Benz. We open the door. I sit down. I was so nervous, man. I was sweating, so nervous. He leans over to me. First thing he says, is he goes, hey bro, you want a massage? And I was like, what kind of party is this, my let? He's like, no, 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 the seats, they have massagers. And man, we drove to the Staples Center. We sat courtside beside Billy Crystal. We saw LeBron James play. He goes, hey, why don't you turn your trip into three days? So one day became three and he told me, look me in the eye on the way to the airport. He goes, I'm going to be to you what my mentor was to me. There's something about you and I believe in you. And there was nothing that could have stopped me from that day forward. I was, I was, 
I, I, I can't remember having it, having it, thinking about quitting from that day forth. And, and, uh, that was the start of me investing myself. Yeah. That's, that's so powerful, man. And again, for, for people like you and I, you know, it, that was, that was a lot of money for you back then. And it, you know, but so many people are looking at the short term, you know, pain of that income, not the long term opportunity of what it can do if you capitalize on it. And they're always looking at it as an expense, whereas somebody like you looks at that as an investment into your future. And that mm -hmm. has gone on to lead you to to have incredible friendships, business partnerships, and the catalyst. And, and you continue to invest in yourself, RTA Syndicate and all these other coaching programs. And I think it's really important for people to, to really take that on. Now, family. Mm. This is a huge one. And and I love that you can speak to this because I don't have the kids. I don't have, you know, your situation. And a lot of people talk to me and they're like, Mike, well, you can't relate to me. Um, but you can. And yeah. I'd love for you to talk about that journey of climbing to the top, being hyper ambitious, putting in exhaustive hours, but you still have an incredible relationship with your family. You still have time for the kids and you've got a kid with, you know, a similar situation health wise as you. So what did that look like for you in terms of, you know, having those conversations and, and being able to still build your wildly exponentially growing business while maintaining that family unit at home? You know, Mike, I, I started in this business single. I, I, I was here in a relationship. I've been here and got married. I've been here with no kids and now I have three kids. So I, I've, I've, I've seen all phases. And it's so funny because I, when we were pregnant with our first child, I remember, I remember a bunch of my friends from outside of our business saying, oh, it's, everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. You're going to, it's, you're going to slow down. I, you, you can't help it. You're just going to slow down. Fucking sped up. Second one, second child. Oh, two's way different than, than one. Had that second child, I had two blessings and two more reasons to go to work. And then we had the third one. Oh, you're going to go from man-to-man -man coverage to zone defense, right? Two are, two are healthy. You should stop it too. Man, if my wife let me, I'd keep having kids. But I, I'll tell you that ship has sailed because she won't let me. Um, it's funny because I, I run my family similar to how I run my team. When dad's, when dad's having dinner, when dad's at an event, when dad's at practice, it means something. I don't go to every single practice. You know, I think just like a lot of people hang too much around their team, I think a lot of people hang too much around their family. If I'm at home every night for five hours with the TVs on statistically for three, that's the average household household and I'm, and I'm around, I want people like, I want to spend time with my kids. So let's, let's talk about what spending time with your kids are. When I'm at home spending time with my kids, there's no electronics. We are, we are literally wrestling. It's called WrestleMania. I, uh, you know, so my schedule is like, like, so I'll give you an example. I'm up every day at 520. I'm at the gym. I'm home around 705 between 705 and 745 is when my kids come down and they've had their teeth brushed, hair, hair, hair combed. They have breakfast and they're out the door at eight. So the 45 minutes in the morning, I'm with my kids. I'm on the way to the office at 745. So I get that morning part. Yeah. There's some nights where I'm at the office late, but when dad gets home, it's nonstop one-on-one -on -one time. There's, I'm not, I'm not doing anything else other than hang out with my kids. If there's a game on, then maybe my son and I are watching the game. I don't go to every damn practice. I'm not at every dry land training. I'm at all of the important stuff. Now we have team meetings Wednesday night. I don't go to anything Wednesday night unless it's important. If it's really important, like it's a recital or it's a big game or a big trophy, that'll be there. My kids know. You think the kids at Tom Brady were upset when he played football on Sundays? Where's dad? My birthday's on Sunday. My birthday party's Sunday at one and dad's not here. Dad must not love me. That's a bunch of horse crap. My kids know that dad's busy Wednesday night and for two hours on Saturday morning because he's building the family empire. He's building the legacy. So when I'm with my kids, when I'm at the game, every time my kids skate by, they make eye contact with me because they know dad's there. It, when I'm with them, it means something. And the second part of that is I enroll them in the business. My kids are always coming by the office. It's Uncle Chad and Uncle Colton. I bring them to the Hawaii trips. I bring them to our conventions. They, my son walks across stage in his little tuxedo and hands out the MVP sword to my frontline leaders who are going to run his company one day. So you have to enroll them and, and it's got to mean something to be there. You just can't be everything to everybody, right? So that's, that's, that's a little bit of my philosophy. And then it, my wife and I, are, every once in a while, we do a date weekend. We get out of town for one night or two. We hit a milestone. We get out for, you know, for a night. I, we take, go to Banff. We do a staycation downtown Calgary, right? We're always working our relationship. So your family shouldn't be, shouldn't be the anchor. 
it, it should be the propeller. It should pro propel you. But if, if you're going to sacrifice your business and success because you want to be a, a better parent, you're just making excuses for yourself. 100%, dude. I love that. And I think, you know, I hear all the time people saying like, you know, I'm a terrible parent if I can't be at everything. And it's like, you know, there's there's a drastic difference between time and quality time and being present. And I think not a lot of people are putting enough weight on the quality time that they're doing. They're just looking at the volume of time, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like the concept of being productive versus being busy. There's a lot of people that are busy for 12 hours a day, but they're spitting their tires and the business isn't growing, right? Mm -hmm. There's very few people that are productive hour after hour in order to build momentum. So I, I love that, man. And, and I think it's, it's been so inc incredible to see that, you know, going back to the concept that lessons are not taught, they're caught. Mm -hmm. You've been able to bring your fit, your family into the experience so that they're seeing what it means for dad to work and for dad to be a leader and a role model to tell them and, and allow them to catch those lessons for mm -hmm. themselves. So it, it's beautiful to see what you've done and, and you've got such an incredible family. So, you know, as we start to pull this thing full circle, the mindset that you needed when things got real, because mm -hmm. you've been in a dark place, you've had some terrible things happen to you, the health and, and, you know, I see that happening a lot right now in real estate is people are, are down and out, they're flooded with negative thoughts, and they're always in this kind of woe is me mentality, and they're struggling to bounce back. You know, when you were in those times where you lost 75 pounds and you were connected to every gadget under the sun, what what was pushing you to say I'm going to come back from this and I'm going to build this bigger and better than ever? All I kept, all I kept thinking about, bro, is the is the comeback. I just I would lay there and think about the comeback. Like like you guys think about the think about your favorite movie, the one that has the comeback, right? I'm a sucker for comeback stories. I'm a sucker for the underdog. My I'd literally lay there and I would design my comeback, design my comeback. And the further I fell, the more I was like, man, the comeback's going to be even bigger. The day I got out of the hospital on top of my whiteboard, I was 128 pounds withering away. Every single one of my veins was blown. I had tape all over my body. I just got out of the hospital. I went to the office on top of my whiteboard. I wrote Steve Holbrook, the comeback kid. And I said to myself, this is going to be one hell of a motion picture. So when you're down and when you're out, just remember the further you fall, the bigger the comeback, right? And it's not about, it's every comeback or sorry, every setback is set up for a comeback. So if your mindset is, if you have a defeatist mindset and you're always feeling down and always feeling defeated, that's it, that, that you got to change your mindset, right? I'm not here to quote all Ed Milet quotes, but he always says things happen for us, not to us, but Every opportunity that you guys have, look, if you've had a three slow months or six slow months or your best guy just quit, this is where you figure out where you're made out of. This is the story that you talk about in three years from now on stage when you're winning MVP. Nobody gives a crap about the story of, of the guy that overcame no obstacles. Nobody cares about that. In fact, we talk about leadership. Nobody can relate to that. People relate to your struggles. You, what you're going through right now, you're going you're gonna to have the authority to talk about when you get through it. And, and you're going to inspire a single mom who's struggling and you're going to retain her and she's going to win because you got your ass off off the mat. That's the kind of stuff that I think about when I'm struggling. I make it about other people. Yeah, dude, that, it's, that's so powerful because, you know, it's always mentioned that, you know, you're, you're most qualified to help the person that you used to be. And I think a lot of people are looking at their flaws and their imperfections as this negative crutch and this obstacle and this barrier. But at the end of the day, those flaws and those imperfections are what make you relatable. And those become your superpowers because now you're going to be able to transform the lives of people that were just like you a few years ago. And, and I love that you talk about the comeback story because, you know, when I was out there door knocking in the fucking snow and hating my life, you know, that that's the one thing that replayed in my mind is that one day this is going to be part of a story that connects with people and realizes that, hey, I can do it too. And mm -hmm. every time I've had negative things happen along my journey, which has been plentiful, um, all I could tell myself is this is going to be one hell of a story. And I think people need to paint that vision that their story one day is going to change lives. But the only way for that story to even happen is if you don't give up and you push through the most difficult of times. Like it's your story and what you went through is the reason that you're mentoring tons of people making six figures and beyond. It's the reason you make multiple seven figures. All of my success, all of my authority as a leader, all my street cred comes from the dark times. 
because that's when we're made, right? People see us at the top, they're like, oh, I can never be them until they hear our story and go, holy crap, I'm just like Mike. I can be just like him. 100% dude and and you know to to wrap this up before before you know talking about how people can follow some of your incredible content what is your advice because I, i've always appreciated this about you what is your advice to people that are playing too small you got to figure out you got to figure out where you want to be you know this is the game called life and one thing that we don't have that's that we don't get more of at the end is time you're heading somewhere you're heading somewhere there's no such thing as there's no such thing as, as as staying still. You're either moving towards something or away from something. You better figure out what you want, because right now chances are you're getting everything that you expect. It's time to change your expectations. It's time to dive into your vision. It's time to really figure out where you want to be. Because if you don't start designing your life, you're just going to keep floating through it. So forgive yourself for where you're at. Let go of the past develop this, 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 this level of self-awareness you've never had. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and get your ass to work on the vision because you're going somewhere. And I'm not sure that you're happy with where that is. So figure it out and make some changes. 100% dude. At the end of the day, you know, nobody's coming to save you. And I think you and I operate like that is that, you know, for, for me, I hear people say all the time, you know, I'm not where I want to be because of my sponsor, my broker, my brokerage, the market, the interest rates, politics, the government, the economy, like they're always playing the blame game. And, and people need to realize that you are exactly where you are today based on your own actions and you deserve to be there. Whether mm. that be good or bad, you deserve to be exactly where you are because the only way you got there is your own actions or lack thereof. And that's mm. usually the case for people. So the only time you can actually change your life is when you can take complete and utter ownership of everything in it. Shit, it's the fan. Could have been somebody else's fault. Make it your fault. Things aren't going well with the economy. Make it your problem. Mm. And once you can make everything your problem, then you can take control of it. And I think a lot of people going forward into the next 12 months need to take control of their own life. Ooh. So good, bro. So, so good. You know, man, you've got so much incredible content out there and you've got a YouTube channel where you're consistent and, and you're, you're sharing so much wisdom based on your experience. Where can people go to follow along with your incredible journey and learn from a guy that has completely changed my life as well? I oh, appreciate that, man. Yeah, if you had guys head to YouTube and you search Steve Holbrook, uh, Steve Holbrook or at Holbrook's world. You find my YouTube channel. I I'm posting regularly, right? Thanks to, thanks to Mike's direction and leadership. You can also find me on Instagram, right? I post there every day. Um, and guys, all the content that I post is me in the game. It's me building leaders, right? It's me doing what I do to help people win. So go over there, check it out. I'd love, I'd love to interact with you. Tell me what you got out of this, uh, got out of this uh, video today and, uh, looking forward to connecting. 100% man. Well, I'm going to link all those below. And, and again, guys, make sure that you you check everything out. And and the final question I've got for you, dude, because you, you've, I've asked you this before, and, and every time it's changed my life. If you had one book that you could recommend to somebody right now that is feeling down and out, discouraged, loss of hope, what would that book be? There's a book written by Steve Siebold. It's called The 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class. I'm telling you guys right now, you need to order that book. You just read one chapter a day. It, it's one or two page chapters. There's 177 mental toughness secrets. Look, chances are it's not a skill set problem. It's a mindset problem. You have to go to work on the most important muscle that you have. And it's the six inches between your ears. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to go pick up this book, read one a day. And, uh, and that book changed my life. Dude, you recommended that to me and my group and we all got it. And now that's part of our book club for, for our mastermind this coming month. And I, I love that you said that because it's bite-sized, super consumable things that reframe and reprogram how you approach business and life. And that to me was life-changing. After you recommended that, I bought it. And again, it just puts so many things into perspective. So Steve, Again, brother, thank you for not just this, but being there since the beginning and, and always inspiring me to get better and to level up. And uh, I can't wait to see what you continue to do to lead and impact thousands of people. Yeah, I appreciate you, Mike. Thanks so much for leading the way, man. You bet, brother. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Go check out all of Steve's stuff. Follow him 
because he's a leader and a role model that you want to emulate. Take care, everyone. If you like this training, make sure to watch this next one because I know you're going to love it.